we need to talk about enemies, about nemeses. <sighs> All right, so let's face it. Chances are, if you've been in any profession long enough, you may have a nemesis. I don't just mean people who you, you know, don't get along with or would not seek out their company. I'm talking about people who did something that gave them a special place in your heart and not in a good part of your heart. And it's important to talk about it because, first of all, we don't talk about it, but when you actually scratch at the surface, you find that pretty much everyone I know, if you really delve down deep, there is often someone who has wronged them in such a way where they, they hold them in this kind of regard. And the question is, what do you do with that situation? How do you navigate it? How do you not be consumed by it? And how do you not let the anger of whatever it is lead you to make poor decisions? Now, a qualification here. When I talk about nemeses or enemies, I am not talking about things that rise to the level of criminal action or of harassment or of things of that nature. I'm not talking about, you know, harboring ill will for someone who has actually violated your rights. That's a completely different discussion and not one that we're going to address here. I'm talking about the kinds of professional violations. Some of them can be criminal but they fall in the realm of, unfortunately, tacitly or explicitly accepted behavior. And so we're going to dive in. I'll give you a few examples from my own life and also from things that I know through the grapevine. No names shall be spoken. But I'm going to share my own reflections, my own thoughts, and invite you to reflect on your own situation because chances are you might have a nemesis too. So I did not enter this profession thinking I was going to have an enemy or nemesis or certainly not seeking one out. And in fact, the person who holds that position in my world is actually someone you know, I'd spent a fair amount of time collaborating with, had shared materials with, had shared you know, draft manuscripts with, and there was no sense, no indication that things would go this way. And that's probably what makes it even harder when it does. I mean, I imagine there are nemeses out there who are complete strangers, just people, you know, someone writes an absolutely unfair, or ungenerous hatchet job of your work, but you've never met them. You know, that might be enough in your world to merit the, 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 the title of nemesis. So it doesn't have to be someone who is close to you. But in my view, it's actually the hardest when it's someone who you know. Now, let's jump into practicals right away. And there are a few different frameworks I'd like to focus on. The short term and the long term of this sentiment. Optics, trusted mentorships and confidants, gut checks over whether or not you're being petty. And then finally, something from my own experience that I think of as positive revenge. Okay, so let's dive into the issue of short term and long term. One of the hardest aspects emotionally to navigate when something has gone really, really wrong in someone's treatment of you or their conduct is that your sense of time really collapses. And it's very easy to go into emergency mode where you're really thinking on an hour by hour, even you know, shorter time frame, and can lose track of a long-term perspective. So Many of you know that I made a separate video on the issue of plagiarism, and I won't revisit that except to say that, you know, I had a very, very shocking experience where I was asked by a press to take a look at a book proposal that they were considering, and when I read it, my jaw absolutely dropped that this person was basically borrowing without any reference to my own work material that was clearly from my research, and in fact, that I had shared in the form of a draft manuscript already by that point. And there are other issues that were even more kind of red flags in the proposal, especially in the marketing section, where all sorts of fictitious claims were being made. But in any event, it was shocking. I had to obviously recuse myself from that review, and it really sent me into a tailspin. This person is more senior than me, more prominent than me, 
And for all I knew, this book that was going to be signed might get out before mine. I mean, I didn't know where it was at. And so can you imagine working on something for, by that point, 12, 13 years? So as a person who is now 43 at that moment, that would have been more than a third of my entire life. And then finding that someone is on the verge of signing a contract with basically your stuff. You can imagine that that is not a moment where most people, unless you're the Buddha, can calm down, center, and think in really long terms. You're thinking right now. You're thinking legal action. You're thinking rage. You're thinking fear, desperation, anger, all of these things that collapse your time frame. And one of the decisions that that could have led me down the path of, and in fact, it almost did, which would have been a radical kind of short-term mistake, would have been to compromise the quality of the book that I was working on, and by which I mean writing the book I wanted to write, and then crash expediting the book out of fear of being preempted, and thereby publishing a book that forever, for the long term, for the rest of my career, the rest of my life, I would always look back upon and feel a sense of, it's not the way I wanted it to be. Like, damn it. And I was very close to that decision. I had the blessing of my press, who was made aware of it and was really shocked by it. I had the, you know, the understanding and blessing of a few trusted mentors. And I was this close to doing it when finally, I don't remember the moment that I came to this, but I, I said, no, this person has, is acting in extreme bad faith, completely unprofessional. In fact, there are elements of this proposal which are illegal. But if I do this, if I react in this way, then I am letting them take away something of even greater value to me, which is doing this thing I have spent so long of my life, not the way I want. And at that point, I had to come to terms with this fear that maybe the book would come out before mine. Maybe everyone would say, hey, Tom, have you seen this book? And, oh, that really reminds me of what you're working on or whatever that might be. Just that kind of say, I'm going to accept that risk, that possibility, but I'm not going to rush the process. I'm going to do it the way I want. And that's what I did. My book ended up winning the top prize in my field. And the other book which is, you know, on its way as I understand it, did not come out before my book. And so at the very least, I was spared that as well. But more importantly, intrinsically, I had made a decision that was authentic to me and I didn't compromise the long-term values that I have to these short-term things. That's one person's experience, experience of plagiarism. But, you know, this can come in many different forms. These kinds of infractions that rise to the level of nemesis can be things like murderously unfair reviews that can have serious career implications. I have heard stories uh, from people I know and trust who, you know, confided, again, no, no names, of having someone else in the field who was so competitive and so territorial about their research and felt like this other person was an interloper, that this person made contact with the fellowship committee that would have funded this other person's scholarship and made the case for them not to fund that person's work. Like, that is next level toxic. That's even worse by a few degrees than, than I know the experience that I had, even though in my case it was also premeditated. But, the, you know, there are these moments. Can you imagine the raw anger and sadness if you learned that someone out there is not only just competitive with you, not only thinks they're better than you, but actually is calling fellowship offices to try to get you denied your sabbatical funding or your travel funding. That's all different level. And it could very easily send you into this short-term crisis mode where you lose sight of your longer term objectives, your values, and you can make decisions that might feel strategically wise in the here and now, or tactically wise here and now, but strategically, will cost you more than they gain you. So keep in mind, your emotion is going to send you down the route of short term when you 
first make an enemy, when you first learn you have a nemesis. And what you need to do is in your own practice, physical, mental health practice, go do 10 yoga sessions in a row in the confidants who we'll talk about in a second. Make sure that you don't lose sight of long-term objectives. The second issue is optics. So what happens if the person who has undeniably done you wrong is more senior than you, is someone who is held in high regard, is beloved, is someone who, you know, most people don't know anything about this side of their personality. And in general, I would say when we think about, you know, what it looks like to have fights in public within academia, I think by and large, they're looked down upon, even if one or both parties are justified in it. We still have this holdover, this idea that academia, despite the fact that we know it's a blood sport, is, is all, you know, is something of this dispassionate, you know, conversation of divergent opinions and whatnot. And yes, it is that, and it needs to be civil in order to function and work. But every single one of us knows that behind that civil demeanor, there is fire, passion, commitment. Our whole lives are put into this. And yet, fighting in public, even if justified, will cost you perhaps as much or more as the other side. Human beings are irrational. Those who are you know, colleagues or, or affiliates or friends or dependents on the other side, their students, people who have worked with in the past, people who were invited to talk at their universities, people whose edited volumes they form part of, they will have an irrational connection with that person and they will not be able to hear that that person is toxic or that person is doing something wrong. Maybe it's just human nature and it's understandable, but you can expect that if you lay out the case that, you know, in the court of public opinion, people who have otherwise been in this person's orbit are going to say like, well put, I hereby sever my relations with this person. Now, again, as I said before, we are not talking about criminal cases of harassment and so forth. In those cases, you do see people cut ties, but I'm talking about things like the ones that I've already mentioned. And what this means is you might want to, you might have the urge to visit your frustration, your anger in some sort of public venue and to throw this out into the town square, you really want to resist that urge because hardly ever, I would say almost never, do you have situations in which the optics of that will serve you. And that's kind of similar to this short-term, long-term thing. Yes, you want there to be equity in the world. You want some sort of <laughs> righteous justice but you do not want to do it in such a way that will end up costing you way, way more than you could ever possibly gain. Because at the end of the day, you might be able to avoid this one person for the rest of your life, and you probably should, but you can't avoid everybody else. You're part of this larger community. So the optics of it, I would say by and large, advise against making this a kind of public battle. Or... I should say, if you choose to do that, know what you're getting into. Know that you will unfairly get dinged, no matter how rock solid your case is, by those out there who just think that that kind of stuff is beneath the profession of academia, or who have an irrational connection with the person and will never abandon them despite the evidence. So optics. The third issue is confidence. In the world of nemeses and in the world of enemies, one of the most difficult things to figure out is who can I talk to about this, if anyone? Obviously, your spouse, your best friend who is not in, in academia. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about within the profession because you do need professional advice every now and then. And the reason why it's so difficult is, technically speaking, you don't really know what any given person's connection is with any other given person. Maybe they're friends. Maybe they went to school together and you didn't know it. Maybe they worked on something together. Maybe they're just one degree removed. And, you know, it is a very vulnerable thing to admit to someone that you have an enemy and they are so-and-so. I have shared this with people who have confided in me. And because they trust me, they have shared something similar with me. And I have to say, I'm always surprised. My reaction is never like, oh yeah, I totally knew you two were enemies. It's like, 
I didn't even know you two thought about each other, let alone we're at this level. But then you find out that something happened. And I can see why this is, but of course on the surface I would never know. So imagine then, in the absence of that information, if you go around just sort of willy-nilly telling everyone, uh, you know, this most vulnerable of things, you know, telling people, everybody indiscriminately who your enemy is, who your nemesis, that's like telling people your password, your, your password recovery code. You just don't want to do it. It's an incredibly private thing. And so, you know, you kind of have to suss out carefully. And I don't have a formula for this, but you just have to be careful to suss out whether or not you're in a place where you can, it's, you're safe to sort of come out of the closet and let someone know the situation and say, I think I have high confidence that what I'm about to say is not going to place me at risk or place me in disadvantage. And let's talk about it. I urge you to make that one of the most guarded aspects of your persona. It's not something that you want to throw around casually because it will eventually cycle back or it can cycle back and you don't want that. But having a confidant, having someone who knows about this situation, it's a lifesaver. It's someone, you know, you can talk to them because once you have a nemesis, they tend to keep showing up in different ways. And it's nice to know that there's someone out there who knows, like when that book comes out, the book that, that book proposal that I read and which like turned my blood cold, that book's going to come out. And it's nice to know that there are few people out there who know how painful of a day that's going to be, like how awful of a day it's going to be to see that book reviewed and have just nobody pay attention to this backstory. It really damages one's sense of, of the profession that this can be you know, allowed to happen. But in any event, you have to figure out who those people are and you have to do it very carefully. So the last thing I want to talk about is the most important thing to me, and that is something I refer to as positive revenge. You have to go to bed with yourself every night. You have to live with yourself. And as is well known, any psychologist learns this, any, any therapist knows this, any, just any relatively aware human being knows this, is that anger and frustration and malice consume you. They damage the one wielding this feeling as much as they have implication for whoever it is is the object of this, of this sentiment. And that's not a way to live. So you're in this weird situation, I think, where something's got to happen. You've got to respond. You've got to do something. Uh, this can't stand. But at the same time, if you were to route that sense towards malicious acts, trying to call up a fellowship center and try to convince someone who's your friend to not fund them, to do something like that, you're going to get off that phone. And if you're, if you succeed, you're going to feel like absolute shit. And if you don't, then there's something wrong with you. Like, but if you do something, if you do harm, even to someone who has harmed you, you're going to regret it. You're going to think about it. And you're just going to say, you know, I, this, this, I let this change me. And that's, that's something that would be even, you know, even worse than rushing a book and publishing it to try to beat the other person to, to the bookshelf and then regretting it. That's one thing. But to live with calling up a fellowship committee and doing this, that's another. So in my own experience, the kind of tactic that I ended up developing, which just sort of emerged and I want to share with you, I think it's healthy. I think it's good. It's positive. It's something, it's a form of revenge you can live with is I responded, I routed all of my anger and frustration towards a few different projects, the goal of which was undoubtedly about increasing awareness of my relationship to this research, like letting people know I've been working on this, letting people know I have a book coming out, letting people know that I am one of the leading experts in this area. And so I just went on the warpath, but my warpath was all about writing articles for magazines, getting things published. I even launched a Kickstarter campaign. Many people who know me and know that I did this crowdfunding campaign on Kickstarter don't realize that the energy behind that was anger, that I was trying to transform into something good. 
because the Kickstarter campaign went on and it succeeded and it got a lot of press coverage. It went on to fund a museum exhibition that featured my collection surrounding my research and my research itself. And that's something that I had wanted to do for a long time. That precedes the nemesis. But I will tell you that when I realized what was going on, you better believe that it put a whole lot of like nuclear energy in my core. And I was like, I am doing this now. I am making this exhibition happen now. I am going to let the world know now. By all told, it's turned in the order of something like 20 articles in major newspapers and major magazines, which in turn turned into honorary for me. So I went on the warpath. And what ended up happening? I ended up writing articles in a bunch of different magazines and people learned something from it. I got paid for it. It increased awareness about my relationship to this research. I did a museum exhibition that traveled the world. I did a Kickstarter campaign, which I'd always kind of wanted to do. People don't realize that was actually revenge. That's where I routed all of that anger. And you know what? I can live with that. Like I can sleep at night with that having been how I went on the warpath rather than any sort of petty, petty thing that might have occurred to me along the way. And, and I'll be honest, many petty things certainly did. So try to think for yourself, if someone has wronged you, if someone really has merited the title of nemesis, how can you wage revenge in a way that is positive? And positive means it creates beautiful things. It creates interesting things. It generates, you know, knowledge, it generates conversation, but also serves your pragmatic strategic purposes of, in my case, getting my research out there in the event, for example, that this person's book got out, because I didn't know the book was just, you know, in print. I didn't really know what the status was. So I was like, well, I'm not going to rush my book, but I am going to get all of this stuff out into the, you know, the written environment. So ask yourself, in your own situation, are there any ways for you to achieve pragmatic, strategic objectives, you know, your response to whatever it is, um, assuming you want to respond at all, while also being able to conduct yourself in a way where you can go to bed with yourself at night and not feel wrong or dirty. That's really important. You're maintaining your well-being in that relationship with this nemesis or enemy is really important because you have a long career and you want to kind of maintain your balance. I will see you in the next tutorial.